what can I say? Good evening. I'm glad you're here tonight. Brother Jimmy's going to be coming here in a little while on his Bible teaching. And uh, he'll be talking more about that. But we're going to open up with prayer tonight. I've got a lot of needs. Mary Lou's at home. Uh, not feeling well. She's hurting a little bit this afternoon. So she decided not to try to set up for the tonight. So anyway, she stayed home. So I want to remember her, Sister Pat Shadden. Let's not uh, forget her. Sister Ruby Norton, the Rays, both of them. Terry Epperson, his wife. And uh, i trying to remember if I would. Kelly Hendricks. Uh, I'm trying to get everybody I can remember. Let's remember Sister Lana Apple. And uh, we'll start over here. Carla Sinus issues. Right, Sister Stephanie. Honor and his asthma. Thank God for that. Right, Sister Zena. About over here, Leonard Bob Chisholm. Let's remember him. I don't either at the funeral. I go in nervous. these needs. Sister Pat. Amen. All right, remember Jerry Jacobs. Father, complicates matters when you're that far away from them too. So let's let's pray for them. Anyone else? All right, we've heard all these prayer requests. Let's find us a place to pray. We will open this service up with prayer tonight. Brother Jimmy will be coming um, immediately following uh, the prayer, and um, be leading our Bible study tonight. But let's 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 remember the lost tonight. The ones that God, uh, God knows their, their heart, knows where they're at. Let's just pray for each one of our loved ones tonight.
while Brother Jimmy's getting ready to come, if I can get Brother Choi and Brother uh, Brandon to come up here and receive our offering. Amen. Amen. May have to turn me down if I get too loud. I switch mics on. Amen. Well, it's a good life serving the Lord. Amen. We're still talking about the Islamic religion. If it's, uh, you ain't been here in a while and you just showed up and found that out, I, I, I hope you weren't disappointed. Amen. Uh, we're learning a little bit about them. And here in just a little bit, just a few minutes, Rhonda's going to show a video. And uh, we're going to talk about, uh, we've talked about a lot of bad stuff, but we're going to talk about some good stuff. So, and brother sam sent me a video um and it was so good i thought well we need to use that and uh and uh, to view that uh want to give a few plugs we're starting membership class this sunday and uh it's going to be tentatively we're right now we're saying it's going to be up these stairs in the first classroom on the right i'm going to have to go look at the logistics of that i think i got 17 signed up right now and so I don't know it's going to fit in that room. And so uh, if it don't, we're going to bump. I'll go do some ciphering in some other classes and and uh, uh, bump and, and get us a room we can all set in because you're going to need a table because we're going to be doing fill in the blank stuff as we go. And uh, it's a great class. You're going to enjoy that. So if you're not a member interested in it, not because you take the class, you have to join the church, but if you think you might be interested, let me know, and I, I really need to know uh, by tonight or very early in the morning because if we go over 24 in the Sister Luana, uh, I might get some more books, but I have 24 books currently made up and ready to go, and it'd be great if you let me know. I've got a big list. I'd love to add your name to that and uh, just uh, see if you're ready to be a member of the church. Amen? That's a good thing. I believe it is, and... Uh, I want to give you another plug. Read through the Bible. You're always talking about reading through the Bible. Read through the Bible. You need to read your Bible. One of the things that helps me stay on track better than anything, you mean preacher, you need help staying on track? We all need help staying on track sometimes. But one of the things I, I kind of uh, bound myself to doing is read through the Bible. And uh, if you uh, like phone apps, uh, I'm trying to remember which one I'm using now. It's that it's one that's on that iPhone, that Bible app. Uh, version. You, you can put that on anything, too. It, it's just the one that's on my phone. version has got a blended read through the Bible in a year plan on it. It'll tell you each day what to read. You check it off. It tells you when you're done. You can move on. If you just can't stand to read on your phone, you can open up your phone, see what you're supposed to read, and open your Bible up and read out your Bible and mark it done on there. But I'm going to tell you what's going to happen. You're going to say, I just don't know if I can do that. It ain't going to be very far reading. You're going to say, man, I've always heard that, and I wondered where it was at. Right there it is in the Bible. Or you're going to read something, you're going to think, man, I needed that. I forgot all about that being in the Bible. Somebody asked me about that the other day, and I couldn't think of nothing. There it is right there in Scripture. I could have told them that. I, I, want, I want to share with you, what I read, me and Brother Arnold's been bouncing back and forth off of each other what we've been reading. And uh, you know, we we do the blessings every morning. And I was telling Brother Arnold, I was reading, you know, Jacob, he kind of snuck in there and got Isaac's blessing away from Esau. And, uh, but he got the blessing. And so he flees off and he goes back to their homeland to Laban and, and, and gets him some wives and he gets misdone there. And it's a long story, but but the blessings on 
Jacob's life the whole time because everything he lays hands on, God's blessing it. Laban sees this. Well, he leaves out. He don't tell Laban he's leaving. Laban takes out after him. And ain't no telling what he's going to do to him because he could kill him, take all the cattle back, and have his daughters and the kids back. But that night he laid down to sleep. And I love this. said he had a dream. And the Lord spoke to Laban and said, You better not speak good or bad to Jacob when you catch up to him. The Lord, the Lord took care of it. That blessing had been pronounced over Jacob, and he said, uh, don't, you, don't you go and speak bad or good over him. You just go. And so I, I was just blown away by how the blessing of God is a tangible thing that can be applied to our life. I, and, I, and I really I believe we could see that in the favor of God in our lives and how that, that we receive things so many times through uh, just the favor of God. Brother Brandon testified a week or two ago, well, actually it's just been about a month ago now, I think, about how he is already seeing the favor of God in his life. Folks, you want the favor of God in your life. Amen? I, I pray for it to be on my life, and I pray when I'm going in the hospital or something or, or going to pray for somebody in the hospital, I pray that they're going to get the best care there. Hey, why? Well, because they're a child of God. Well, that's kind of that's kind of not fair, ain't it? Well, I don't know about fair, but I want it. <laughs> Amen? They could have it if they wanted it too. All they have to do is repent and ask the Lord in their life and ask God to give them favor. Amen? But I'm going to ask for it. Well, we're fixed to see a video. And uh, I, like I said, I wanted to talk about the, uh, the good stuff. And this video is going to be a testimony of a young lady and there's a few things I want you to be looking for in this video. One thing is the consequences, and it, I believe it's early on in this video, it speaks of the consequences of a Muslim converting to Christianity. I don't think we think about that a lot. You know, if you decide, most of us, if we decide to be a Christian, our parents patted us on the back and said, hey, that's a good choice. Right? Wait till you hear what her parents did. And and uh, I want you to see if you could see the joy in this young lady as she's talking about, even under great persecution, the joy that she has in her life. And we may not watch the whole thing, but I'll, I'll give you a heads up when we've had enough of it, Rhonda. Go ahead. When Rivka Berry was 16, her Muslim parents found out she had renounced Islam and become a Christian. That's when Rivka ran away from home and took refuge with Christians in Florida she had met on Facebook. Rivka had heard stories of so-called honor killings for those who renounce Islam, and she feared that if she returned home, her father would try to kill her. This is not just some threat. This is reality. This is truth. Today, the 22-year-old college student tells her remarkable story in a new book, Hiding in the Light, Why I Risked Everything to Leave Islam and Follow Jesus. Amazing story. Rifka Berry is joining us now. Rifka, it's good to see you. God Thank bless you. Thank you, Pat. It is great to be here. You uh, were raised initially in Sri Lanka, and uh, then you traveled to the United States. But your family was Muslim. What did that mean to you, being a Muslim, when you were a kid? That's right. Well, it meant that uh, I learned how to read the Quran before I even learned how to talk. Yeah. It meant that I learned how to pray five times a day. It meant that I fasted for 30 days starting at age six or seven. Yeah. No water. Um, my family came from a very strict and devout. But, did you know what was you were reading? You were reading, it was, it was in Arabic. You didn't speak Arabic. That's right. But the way that I was raised, we lived as if this was the air we breathed. Mm -hmm. And so just as my last name is Barry, we are Muslim. Well, what about your father? He was an educated man, wasn't he? Yes, he, he was a businessman. He sold jewelry, and so he would travel many, many times to the United States or different parts of the world to sell gems. Well, what did he do when he came home? How did he treat you and your mother? You know, there were two situations that happened that changed everything for me as a child. Yeah. And one was I was uh, sexually violated by an extended family member. 
uh, and the other, in the same year, I was blinded by my brother in my right eye. He threw a toy at you. You, you were right. fighting over a we toy. We were just, I know. And, you know, these two situations, normally, if this were to happen in the United States, would be the abuser would be seen in this sexually violation, it would be seen as, a shame, as shameful, yeah. you know, the one doing the abusing. And yet, in my culture, the shame is cast on the victim. And so... In other words, when a girl gets raped, she's at fault? That's right. Why? Because she's It's enticed. all about honor. It's all about yeah. retaining honor. So my family leaves, we leave Sri Lanka in order to retain our honor. And we, you, and my family uses my, my, my eye as an, ex, as an excuse. And we... Well, your mother apparently was a very uh, uh, talented woman. She wasn't highly educated, but she learned all kinds of skills. That's right. but, but did your father beat her up? You know, my father, I, he, he was, it was more of a cultural oppression. She didn't have a voice. Mm -hmm. And I got more of the beatings than my mom did. Well, how, well, describe a beating. What did they do to you? I would remember, I mean, as being thrown around, I would be happy and just joyful. And if I was too happy, I would, um, I remember my father just beating me to the point where I, I went flying across the room. Well, you're just a tiny little thing. Is he a big guy? Yes. Well, to me, he was He's big. big yeah. <laughs> Everyone's big to me. But the finally, with this oppressive system of Islam, you, you, what did you think you were praying? It, it, was there no escape for you as a young woman in Islam? Really, there wasn't. Although I gave myself completely to Islam, I was the the more I wanted freedom, the more I gave myself to it, and yet it was so empty, and mm -hmm. I felt. Like I was caged and suffocating in rules, and I wanted out. So you began to, you, you had a friend, and the friend got you to church. You went to a church, and before it was finished, you were baptized. That's right. Yeah, later on, I ended up being baptized, but one young, brave woman in junior junior high had the courage to just ask me to come come to church with me yeah. and she was a normal christian you know grew up with Christ, christian parents and and after her invitation i went and had a life-changing encounter where i experienced the love of god that captured my spirit and mm -hmm. left me changed well your father found out and what did he say to you when he found out that's right. I couldn't hide it for long. Um, mm -hmm. After that encounter at church, I would hide my Bible late at night. Mm -hmm. I would go out to prayer meetings when my parents didn't know. I would be in the bathroom to just read the Word of God, do anything just to feed my heart. But it got to the point where it couldn't be hid anymore. And my father approached me and um, said that, there, told me what, I, what the consequences would be, which would be death. So he'd kill you. And did you think he was serious? That he really was going to kill you? I did. You I did. feared for my life, and I didn't think I would be alive the next day. As in, I I did not plan on running away. I was planning on giving my life for Jesus. Why, why didn't your father kill you? Well, he he gave me a couple days. He gave me an ultimatum. It was kind of more on having in his in a sick way having mercy on me and mm -hmm. giving me a couple days to return. And um, during that time, my mom found another book, which made him cut his trip short from a business trip to um, take care of me, which first the, the mosque found out, ended up finding out. And once my dad wanted to have mercy, but then when the mosque got involved, there was no alternative. He had to kill you. I mean, yes. Is that, I mean, you were living in America, and yet a Muslim in America whose daughter comes to Jesus, comes to Christ, must get killed. Is, is that the rule? That's the rule. Yes. And he, he, it's, he's honor, uh, it's an honor killing. Yes. And in the same way that my family left Sri Lanka in order to yeah. retain our image, now I have done the despicable. This is the ultimate, ultimate, ultimate shame for my family is that I prayed to another God and committed myself especially to Jesus Christ. So how did you get out of it? How did you get Through out of it? God's sovereignty and miraculous way I um, was connected to I first I received a message ahead, on Facebook by a lady named I can get you the link to that if you want to watch that uh, in the entirety uh, she talks from that point on about how that she uh, gets out of the home and, and another Christian kind of rescues her and talks about when when she leaves that for a couple of days she had no food or no water whatsoever 
and uh, just with th with this video and, and and it's a testimony that Brother Arnold gave me this week about he was talking to me about a revival that went on in Argentina and and the things that they would suffer and or were suffering for that and then to hear what I thought boy now that that's a dedication to the Lord did you catch the part where she talked about she sat in the bathroom late at night and just trying to feed her soul with the word wow wow I that, that's a genuine hunger for the Lord amen and, and did you catch what she said about how that one junior high high school student was so brave to invite a Muslim just to come to a church service well it stands to reason uh, and I, I haven't searched this out but it stands to reason to me that that young that young girl invited her to church could be in danger from that mosque or from those parents for inviting their daughter to church and and and, and see you see th there's a, a huge sacrifice for a Muslim to convert to Christianity. I mean, if what she said is true tonight, then I think nobody in here can deny uh, what she said was that in America, even in America, that if a Muslim converts to Christianity, the, the, the Muslim law is, is that that, that con converted child must die or adult. Wow. And, and, and they're still doing it still converting over to that uh, Rhonda can you go ahead and put that next picture up now y'all don't y'all don't know this person very well uh, but I do he was one of my instructors in, in Bible college out in Phoenix uh, his name is Dr. Fiz Rahman and uh, we just call him Dr. Rahman I believe that he had two doctorates, uh, which means he's a doctor doctor. But what, what you might not know, let me read a little bit about this. Faiz Rahman was born and raised in a Muslim home in Calcutta, India. As a little boy, he was in a Muslim home in Calcutta, India. And there was a missionary family whose name was uh, Mark and Hulda Buntain. And, and they are, I, I don't know if you've heard those names, Brother Arnold, but, but I have heard them several times, and, and, and they were famous in that, in that region for converts. It's a wonder they lived. It's only because of the Lord that their lives were spared. Uh, so uh, he found salvation uh, while he was in a high school at an Assembly of God Church school in Calcutta uh, under the ministry of these. Uh, he finished high school with top honors, academically including serving a uh, student body president uh, he enrolled in Bethany University in Santa Cruz California where he was listed three times in who's who among students in American colleges and universities uh, he also elected to serve the student body president has a master's degree in education and just goes on down uh, what I have here his his resume of things and so very very uh, educated but I was I was able to hear his full testimony that he shared with us while we was in school, and uh, when he converted, of course his dad uh, and his brother put a price on his head to to be killed. Uh, that that if they found him, they'd kill him. So they had to get him somewhere. I don't know where, but they got him away from that because they was going to kill him. Now I can't imagine, and I don't think you could either. Uh, we may all have relatives that have done things that maybe we didn't like or didn't agree with but usually we don't think about well i'm i'm gonna kill them if they do that you know we're gonna we're gonna go over to their house and we're gonna kill them because of what they've done that don't enter into our reasoning so uh, it's not just a human thing i believe that it's a quran thing amen do we agree with that it maybe it's a training up thing that that believe and it could come from some of the scriptures and, and tonight we're going to talk about uh, the Quran uh, and violence it's no surprise that Islam uh, not only condones violence but actually commands it in certain instances in, in Surah 
and I may be not pronouncing that right. It's S U R A, and these are are the labels in the Quran, and the scripture number is nine five. And I could tell you, if you find a Bible hard to read, uh, well, I don't recommend it, but you could pick a Quran up and you think, wow, because it's like every little scripture is a whole different thought, and so there is no flow. To me, there was no flow much at all. But 9.5 says, When the sacred months are over, slay the adulterers wherever you find them, arrest them, besiege them, and lie in ambush everywhere for them. If they repent and, and take to prayer and render, alms, uh, render the alms levy, allow them to go their way. God is foregoing and merciful. And so <clears throat> another way to say that is, is if they convert, then let them live. But if they don't convert, can we fill in the blank there? Y'all help me out, and then I'll know y'all's with me. What are they supposed to do if they don't convert? Slay them. Yeah. And uh, <clears throat> that's not the only one. Now, let's say that, that, that we wanted to be argumentative tonight, and, and you very well could. I, I mean, I could see where you use that, that scripture. Let's say you just put it to memory, and you were speaking to a Muslim person, and you use that scripture. Well, they're very likely to pull up some Old Testament scripture up and say, does it not say in your Bible uh, to do this and, and to do that? You know, and so uh, we're aware that we live under a new covenant, you know, and the New Testament. And so uh, a person could, could stand a chance to get themselves into a firefight displaying uh, scriptures like this. Another one is 5 and 33. It says, Indeed, the penalty for those who wage war against Allah and his messenger and strive upon the earth to cause corruption is none but they be killed or crucified or that their hands and feet be cut off uh, from opposite sides or that they be exiled from the land. That is uh, for them a disgrace in this world and for them in the hereafter a great punishment. Uh, Christians don't, for the most part, as well as I know, talk about killing or cutting hands and feet off. And, and uh, I mean, I know there's one scripture said if your hand offends you to cut it off, but I, I think that you need to read that scripture in context and apply it rightly. Um, so I, I, do, I do believe that we're talking about a very violent uh, religion. Now, I'm going to say this, and you're going to hear me say things, and you may wonder why as we go through different belief systems talking about them. I don't necessarily think that every Muslim you be meet believes this. And, and, and wh well, what do you mean by that? Well, let me give you an example. Let's move over to Christianity for a while. There's people that confess to be Christians, and you can ask them a question about the Bible, and they don't have no idea what you're talking about. You know what I'm saying? And so uh, it stands to reason that there are Muslims that converted uh, to Islam and have no idea about this violence. All they've ever seen is the peaceable, uh, peaceable Muslims. And, and, and that would make sense. Uh, but I will say this, as we go into studying cults a little bit later on, you're going to realize with, with a lot of cult activity, the, the initial, the greetings, the salutations of that cult are, are, not, are not so bad. I mean, really, they're really super nice, and they seem like great people, and, and they got great belief systems. Man, they help each other out. It's just a great group of people. And it's long down the road before they ever realize that there's some bad stuff involved here. And... Uh, the demonic starts to seep into some of the things that we, you know, we talk about, and uh, so anybody got a question or comment so far? Yeah, that's kind of how he did Eve, wasn't it? You know, just went to kind of talking to her and twisted her that way you know uh, a lot of people you talk to that get brought out of cults say I never meant to get that far into that I never meant for it to happen like that you know 
And I, I'll say that. Sometimes people come to church here, okay? <laughs> and we, I, I don't believe we're a cult, but I'm just going to say, some people come to church here, and the next thing you know, they done got too far in before they realize, you know, the Lord done got a hold of them. Well, uh, I don't believe that there is any God associated with uh, Islam religion other than the devil. And, and what I mean by that is, is we either serve one or two masters, Right? You know, I had to debate with the guy at work one time that believed that they was uh, black and white magic. And uh, he, I said, yeah, but it's the same devil. And he said, no, I, I, what do you mean? And I said, well, I said, if they're not believing in Jesus Christ and they're not Christians and there's only one other source to get power from and it don't matter whether you're calling it black, white, yellow, blue, or green, I said, it's the same devil. And... Uh, and so uh, I look at it like that. If they're not serving the God that we serve, but here's the, here's the real kicker nowadays. They're wanting, that's how, they, that's how they confuse and manipulate and pull into their religion. We're all serving the same God. Well, that sounds good. Let's all be buddies. And, and, and so, but none of, your, none of your thoughts and stuff are going to matter. It, what's going to come down to anything that's in opposition to the Koran is going to be thrown out. And uh, you may have heard me use this term before, circling, circular reasoning. And uh, I'm going to talk about it. It's a logical fallacy in which the reasoner begins with what they're trying to end with. In other words, the assumption for a Muslim is, is that the Koran and, uh, uh, come from heaven and that Muhammad is his prophet. And then they reason everything else out from that instead of starting from the other end and, saying, and working their way towards and so, therefore, the Quran must have come from heaven and Muhammad must be his prophet. They don't start, they start with the assumption that that's already true and work their way back. Now, does that make sense? Instead of working your way towards an end, like saying, well, because uh, that uh, there was 500 witnesses of Jesus' resurrection and because uh, historical documents besides biblical documents document that Jesus was born, uh, crucified, buried, and resurrected, then, then we could come to the, the realization that Jesus Christ was truly the Son of God and what he said is true. And that's the way we should reason. But circular reason operates opposite of that. They'd say because Jesus Christ is the Son of God, uh, then all these other things are true. And, and what that enables them to do is then to say that anything that's in opposition with that must be wrong because our initial statement is is that the Quran came from heaven and that Muhammad is the prophet of God. Does that make sense? Go ahead. It's set up to what? Yeah. 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 And, and there's a great author out there called uh, Lee Strombel. I believe that may not be the right pronunciation, his last name. He wrote several books, The Case for Faith, The Case for Christ, The Case for the Bible, and he is an investigative reporter that takes every one of those subjects and, and goes at it from his exact investigative reporting stance. And so he gives you some real great uh, tools and tactics for de uh, debating your faith with others, you know, and uh, really... His story, his testimony is pretty amazing too. Uh, you you heard me uh, over the last few weeks talk about pre-Islamic Arabia. Uh, now I've been concerned about saying that because I, I wonder if uh, y'all understand what I mean by that. Uh, Islam deems that it's uh, blasphemous to even suggest that the teachings or or the Quran of the teachings of Muhammad or the Quran find their source in pre-Islamic custom, culture, or religion. <clears throat> so if the sources for Islam can be found in pre-Islamic Arabia culture, custom, or religion, this will go a long way to proving that Muhammad's faith and the Quran did not come from heaven. Okay, so this is, I'm going to try to break that down as simple as I can uh, with this little old feeble mind of mine. What we're saying is, and what we've been saying through this book we've been using, uh, the Islamic invasion, all along is, is they're saying that he didn't, Muhammad didn't receive no new 
revelation from, from Allah God because everything that he's come up with and that's written in the Quran had its root and its essence in pre-Islam Arabian culture. Does that make sense? So in other words, it existed. Everything that, that, that saying the Quran come up with was already being done in their culture. It was just things that they got together and deified. Uh, so in other words, if, if uh, and we're going to talk about this, and I'll repeat again later probably, it, 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 taking a, a pilgrimage to Mecca was already happening before Muhammad ever had the revelation uh, of the Quran and an uh, angel uh, coming down and speaking to him. They were already doing that. They just wasn't doing it to Allah. Every pagan religion of that time in that area was practicing these kinds of things. And it was madness. I mean, uh, Pentecost in its glory couldn't, couldn't write some of the things that these folks were doing. They'd go on a pilgrimage to Mecca, and they'd run around the building seven times and kiss a stone, and then they would run off this certain direction, and they'd throw rocks at the devil. Now, I've heard some pretty good stories in the Pentecostal churches of some wild stuff going on, but that's a, a doozy. Well, guess what? That's, in, that's, that's part of uh, Islam. But it was something that was being practiced before Islam ever come on by different pagan religions of the time. And, and so, uh, wow. And, and all of this being true, and whenever you're using uh, sources like we are, <coughs> there's a variance for some area uh, error in words and, and things that we use. And so... Uh, if you come across something, you say, well, he's wrong on that. Well, depending on what sources you use, you know, we live in an age when Wikipedia it seems like a great tool, right? Well, my understanding about Wikipedia is anybody can go on there and write what they think about anything. And if that's correct, I'm going to start using it. i got some ideals. <laughs> I'm going to change the world with Wikipedia. No, you think about it. And, and the same thing with using Internet websites for re reference. And, and I do that a lot. Me and Brother Arnold, I've talked to him about a lot, the, some of them I use. And I have some that I go back to because they've been very reliable. But I'm telling you, you can get on there and you can find some, <laughs> some stuff, man. And I tell you what I hate the worst is when you think you've got one, boy, this looks good. And you're about halfway down and they go off out in left field and... and go to talking about the keyboard else or something, you know, and you're like, wow, I didn't see that coming. But uh, uh, I like that CARM website real good, Christian Apologetic Research Ministry. I'm quite sure that, that me and him would have some differences in opinion, and uh, but all of his stuff on there is well written. It's uh, well explained. It has great reference material on there. So if you're looking to go in there and you can look up about anything, you can look up. Uh, Mormonism, Jehovah Witnesses, Catholicism, about anything you want to look up is on there. And uh, I don't know that, that you'll agree with him completely doctrinally on everything, though. And what I mean by that is his beliefs to, go, to God. Uh, the city of Mecca, let's talk about that. Mecca was under control, and they use a term here, it's Q U. R-A-Y-I-S-H. And I don't even know how to attempt to say that. And most of these words, you couldn't go to the dictionary and just hit the sound button and repeat after them and do it that way. So, uh, But we'll just say the tribe to which Mo uh, Muhammad was born. Uh, Mecca was under control of the tribe to which Muhammad was born. Now let that soak in for a minute. Mecca was under control to the tribe which Muhammad was born. But it gets better. Mecca was also the dominant religious center for all pagan religions in Arabia. Well, now don't don't that knock your hat in the creek. So it just so happens this is this this is like the current of the Islam world. It's it's the center. I mean, it's it's where everything's happening, you know. 
uh, when we studied Corinthians that time, we said what happened in Corinthians, state in Corinthians is like Vegas, you know. But but Mecca is this is just that. It's the Mecca of pagan religions. And so uh Encyclopedia Britannica points out that the financial base of that tribe depended upon the caravans and the trade routes that would particularly go through Mecca in order for pagans to worship their particular idol at Kabbal pre-Islam. Pre-Islam. And so, hmm, if I'm a shyster that, that's looking to come up with a new religion and... Uh, you know, and and I can understand that that, that could be taken completely wrong, uh, what I'm saying. But, man, I believe that he pulled every aspect of pagan religion into this thing so that he could incorporate. He's pulling in all these pagan uh, people. And now that we understand that Mecca is the center of all this, this pagan religious stuff and, and, and that their, their, their profit, their money, their wealth, all hinged upon them trades coming through there, well, would it be important to put, let's see, I think that once, at least once in their life, they ought to have to travel to Mecca. And, and there was a pilgrimage to Mecca before there was an Islam. So when Islam come along, guess what? One of the five pillars was a pilgrimage once in your lifetime to go to Mecca. Why, why is that important? I, I just want to make sure you're catching this. Well, what happens when we, when we look at tourist towns and the tourism stops? We've seen it going up Highway 7 here during, during the, uh, with the financial uh, drought, how that some of these businesses that were along the way up there uh, drained out because people weren't stopping. Well, same thing with Mecca. It would eventually drain out if, if something wasn't drawing people to come there and spend money. Well, I bet you they just happen to have all the trinkets for sale. I bet you they're selling them little rocks that you thought at the devil, five for a dollar. Yeah? I bet you that you had to have some kind of special sacrifice, and if, if you couldn't bring one from home, guess what? We're having a sale this week on, on those. Just so happened we're having a sale. And, and buddy... After the pilgrimage season was over, they was ready to take a vacation. They'd racked it up, buddy. They'd, they'd piled in the money. You see how corrupt this thing could have been? And anything that, that men are involved in coming up with is going to be corrupt. And I look for it to come to an end. Amen? I know that if, if, if it holds out to the Lord's return, it will come to an end. But uh, it, this thing's even evolving. Even You see... That the, uh, um, and I believe I had it somewhere in my notes that that Islam is split up into two, two. Did we talk about that last week? That they're split up into two sects, the the Sunnis and the uh, uh, anyway, and one of them is way more violent than the other. Uh, I, I found this interesting. I wanted to make sure I got this in because this is the last week we're going to talk about Islam, and some of you may have said Amen right there. Uh, we, I wanted to talk about the magic and the genies because, you know, I hadn't really thought about that until I started studying this time. You know, I remember that movie Arabian, uh, the Arabian Nights or something like that where they had magic carpets and and uh, all that stuff. And, yeah, and Aladdin and all that stuff. That was Arabian, um, you know, uh, all that stuff that went on. Well, that was pre-Islam Arabia. Well, and, and so... Uh, the pre-Islamic religious life was primarily uh, superstitious, believing in the evil eye, the casting curses and spells, magic stones, genies and fairies, uh, which, which sound like nonsense, but, you know, uh, you'd be shocked at what people believe in, you know. I've seen people that just absolutely wouldn't walk under a ladder that's leaned up against something. I've, you know, I've known the people, the cat run across the road. Yep, we got to go back the other way. Black path crossing our, the black cat crossing our path on the start of a journey is a bad omen. Uh, okay. Can you? Yeah. 
Well, if you if you run around the ladder seven times and throw rocks at the devil, you're okay too. Hey, we laugh, but I'll guarantee you there's somebody you know that's got some superstitions, and you just think that it's a joke. They ain't joking at all. <laughs> They're not joking at all. Uh, they're serious about it, and uh, it should be no surprise in the Quran contains such things as the evil eye, casting curses, spells, magic stones, genies, and fairies. Well, why would it have stuff like that in there? Draws those pagans in, pulls them pagans into it. You know, the devil tried to come, it really tried to come at Christianity like this. Uh, early on and, and tried to draw pagan things. There's a, you know, there's a great argument that some of the things that goes on in the church world are, are pagan in their roots. And, and boy, you can never get an, a fuss started like that. But here's some uh, references to those things that, that Surah, which is uh, the Quran, uh, chapter 55, 72, 113, and 114, if you wanted, if you want to go look at those things, I don't even suggest you mess with that book. You know, uh, I have looked at it very little. It was just to look at these references that I was given. Uh, I'm not into messing with that stuff no more than you have to. Whenever, whenever uh, we studied demonology in school, I thought, oh, this is gonna be, this is gonna be something. I'm ready, boy. The professor said, we're not gonna spend time much time in this class at all on this. I said, well, why not? He said, because I don't believe we ought to spend much time talking about demons and studying demons. He said, we can know all we need to know about in just a little bit and go on. And I thought it was great advice. Uh, some of the things that you uh, that could come from pagan rituals are uh, uh, bowing and praying to Mecca. That could have come from pagan ri rituals, pe uh, pilgrimage to Mecca. <laughs> The run around Kaaba seven times and kiss a black stone and then run a mile to the Wadi Mina and throw. Hold on, I'm having technical difficulties here. Throw stones at the devil. These pagan practices compromise the religion in which Muhammad would have been raised. Which I might, I'm gonna point out right now. In fact, quit stuttering long enough. I'm gonna point out right now that the religion that he was raised in was not Islam. Now, ain't that a poking eye? Couldn't have been the religion he was raised in because he received the revelation from Allah himself, so he couldn't have been raised in it. All right, what I want to end with, uh, this is the cult of the moon god. It talked about it in this book, and I thought, well, uh, what has that got to do one with the other? Well, I mentioned earlier on in our classes that that uh, it's believed that Allah, before he was the Allah of Islam, was the Allah of the, of, that is the moon god. And uh, so we're going to talk about that. It says, no surprise that the word Allah was not something invented by Muhammad or revealed for the first time by the Quran. Uh, you know, uh, it didn't come from him. It preexisted. And, and this book gives references even to archaeology that predates him where the word Allah was used all the way even in North America. So don't that knock your hat in the creek. So they've been talking about this Allah uh, for long before Muhammad, but not just as uh, the Allah of Islam. He was, and we're going to find out, as we go, a Middle East scholar, H. Gibb, points out the reason that Muhammad never had to explain who Allah was in the Quran is that his listeners had already heard about Allah, Allah long before Allah was ever born, or before Muhammad was ever born. Yeah, I got that out right there at the end. So he never had to explain Allah uh, because they already had heard of an Allah. So he just took that up and run with it. And so, uh, the word Allah comes from a compound. Comes from a compound word from what language? Would you guess if you had to guess? Anybody? That's it. If I had a candy bar, you'd win it, brother. It's Arabic. Imagine that. <coughs> so it's a compound Arabic word, and it's spelled A-L slash I-L-A-H. 
the all is a definite article for the, and the Elah is an Arabic word for God. The word is pure Arabic. And so it really means, if you translate it, it means the God. The Cyclopedia of Religion, Allah, is a pre-Islamic name corresponding to the Babylonian Baal. Well, have we heard anything about Baal worship? In, in Arabia, the sun god was viewed as a female goddess and the moon god was a male god. Many scholars such as Alfred, uh, and I can't even say his name, and I don't know what language it is. Uh, anyway, Alfred says that the moon god was called by various names, one of which was Allah. So we've already just here in this have seen it associated with Baal and with the moon god. Now, I don't know if this Baal, uh, it's not spelt like the one in the Bible, but I have sneaky suspicions that, uh, uh, that they're related to the one, the one in the Bible and the, and the Babylonian one uh, to that idol worship that we see in the Bible. And I believe they were sacrificing their children to, uh, no, I think that was Moloch, yeah. Shot down by the front row. All right, so get your thinking caps on. We're almost done. There's a symbol of the worship of the moon god in Arabian culture and elsewhere throughout the Middle East. Can anybody guess what it is? Raise your hand. Don't just shout it out. Anybody want to guess what it is? There's a symbol, Brother Nathan. Crescent moon. That's it. So this same crescent moon that we now see associated with Islam was associated before that with the, uh, uh, the moon god in, in Arabian culture. And, and not just in Arabian culture, but it says throughout the Middle East. So even their symbols and stuff was not uh, theirs to take, you know. Well, I understand whenever your God wasn't born in the beginning and he ain't going to be here to the end that you got to figure out some things about him. And so they had to kind of pick one from here and pick one from there. But if you're serving the Alpha and the Omega, you ain't got to come up with nothing. Whenever you got a hold of the one that can say, well, if you do this, you might go to heaven. Thank the God we serve. He said, if you do this, you will go to heaven. He told us to let not our hearts be troubled. If we believe in God, believe also in who? Jesus. He said, he goes and prepare a place for us that where he is, where we may be in also. Amen. He's went to prepare a place for us. I don't know what Allah's doing. I ain't real sure what Muhammad's doing. Uh, well, yeah, I'm pretty sure I know what Muhammad's doing right now. <laughs> he's figured out, oops. Why? Because to be absent from the body is to be present with God for the Christian. But I don't know where you go uh, if you ain't a Christian when you become absent from the body. I guess a holding place. And uh, if so, he's figured out. I wonder what judgment will be like for people that come up with false religions and cults. According to what I think I know, it's going to be the same thing for the liar and the gossip and the murderer and the backbiter and, and the one that hated his brother. Wow, I thought about that today as we're closing. If we say we love God and we hate our brother, how dwell the love of God in us? We are a, we are a belief of love. The God that we serve is love. He said he is love. And so, folks, I'm fishing to get on our toes. You ready? Get them out there. Might as well just do like you do when you got to get a tooth pulled. Just get it out there where you can get that dude yanked out. Folks, we can't hate Muslims because they're Muslims and say that we serve a God that is all love. That girl was invited to church by a high school girl 
she went to church one time. Amen. I'm fixed to have y'all testify about what y'all told me earlier, so just get ready. Uh, and she gave her heart to the Lord. Why? Because I believe she, I don't know where she went. It could have been, we talked earlier, it could have been a Church of Christ church, could have been a Baptist church, could have been an Assembly of God church. But she went somewhere, she felt love. She felt something besides some rules. And she got a touch from the, from the master's hand. And she said, her words was, it changed my life. There wasn't no way they was going to find out. They couldn't help but find out. Why? Because she began to bubble. She got a hold of the source. Tell, tell us what your granddaughter sa said. Amen. I don't know. Uh, and there'd just be speculation on, on Brother Sam's part that it don't happen in their church. But the girl feels something when she comes here. I believe that if we can show people love and witness to them, folks, it ain't just getting them to church, sis. It's, it, you know, I'm for, if you if you ain't got no, no, no more courage but to invite them to church, invite them to church. But did the Bible didn't call you to be church inviters. It said, go out and be witnesses unto me and to the whole earth. It said that my Holy Spirit will give you power after it's come upon you to be witnesses, not church inviters. Amen. And boy, I'm convicted by that sometimes because we can shake a leg in here on Sunday and we can dance and fall out and, and have a great emotional time. But sometimes we ain't got enough juice to get a, get a nerve up to tell somebody that Jesus is the one that gave it to us. He said, I send you another comforter. Amen. He sent him to tell, help us to tell others about him. Now, I'm for inviting them to church because I've seen the miraculous happen. Just get people in church. Man, I remember. That's all Dwayne did. Of course, he's telling me I was going to hell. I mean, long before he ever got me to church house, he had me hanging over hell. And, 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 and he's preaching it hot. But when I got in, I'm literally one of those testimonies. I don't remember what Brother Arnold said that day, but I remember something had done got a hold of my heart and my life, and it didn't matter what he was saying. I felt something alive and real in the church. I believe in God's house, folks. We need that which is alive and it's real, that genuine that could change a young Muslim girl's life in so much. What did she do? Boy, well, she, she laid down sin. Well, that's notable. But she didn't just lay down sin, folks. She laid her family down. She said, Jesus, I love you so much that I'm willing to turn my back on my mom and dad if that's what it takes and go all the way with you. Now, that's something to, for a girl that age to say, you know, and, and, and she knew. She'd been raised up in that. There wasn't no question whenever she made that what was going to happen. Did you hear a crying at that one point? said, it's not a story they're telling. It's really going to happen. They're going to kill me. And then she determined in her heart that she wasn't going to leave. That's the last that you heard on there. She had determined in her heart, I'm, I'm going to die right here in this house for Jesus. Wow. Folks, if that don't get you to reading your Bible and praying, <laughs> we're lacking somewhere. Oh, Lord, help me to tell them about Jesus. Lord, help that girl that she don't die. You reckon she has to have her hand twisted to witness? No. Not Dr. Rahman either. Uh-uh. He was loud and proud about, about loving the Lord, folks.
loud and proud. It's going to cost us something in this last hour. Wow. How, what would... <laughs> boy, I've done poked this in the eye. I'll just go on. What would it look like if we went to about 50% Muslims converted to Christianity in here? They had to give up their whole family and everything they knew to serve Christ. I wonder how we'd feel dropped in like seeds among them when they come dragging the people in, bringing in the sheaves. you got to have what I have. you got to have this. It's that good. It's that great. It's that awesome. As we're closing tonight and you're standing to your feet, I, I, you know, and, and we didn't preach tonight. We just, we just taught. But I want you to close with that thought. Is it still that good? Is it still that awesome? I remember that day when I got saved. There was no, I did nothing, nothing I wanted more than to get to that altar and get that salvation that they'd been talking about. I wanted it. I wanted it with everything that was within me. Is what, what you got tonight, is it still that way? And if it's not, I could tell you the Bible said he ain't changed. He's not changed. He's not left you. And he's not forsaken you. It only operates from the other side. If it's changed, you've left him. You've forsaken him. You went another way. You lost your fire. Paul told Timothy to stir up the gift that is within you. Stir, plant that flame. So tonight, would there be anybody tonight, I just want to ask, let's just close our eyes. People feel a little more comfortable that way. Would there be anybody in here tonight? That, that first off, that you just don't know the Lord and, you, and, and you've heard what we've talked about tonight and you believe that it's that good and that great and you want it, if that's you here tonight and, and maybe you've backslidden and you've known what it's like to have that fire and that zeal and you don't have that tonight, is there anybody in here that would like to pray and just come to the altar and pray tonight and seek God in their life? Amen. All right, you can look at me. Uh, let's, let's let that meditate in our minds before we come back to church again on Sunday. Maybe let it stir us to action tomorrow in our, in our life uh, to think about that young girl's testimony. You know, that's gonna, I'm going to tell you, that's going to affect me what she said tomorrow because I'm going to see somebody. I know I'm going to see somebody that's going to need Brother Arnold to hear about Jesus. And I'm going to think, she turned her back on her whole family. And I can't get enough nerve up telling about how good the Lord is. Amen. Let it stir you. Father, tonight, as, as we get ready to leave this place, we just pray, God, for your, your favor and your anointing on this people. Lord, I pray, God, as they leave out of here tonight, Lord, that they'd sense your presence, God. Not only sense it, but, Lord, but have a desire to take it with them. Lord, to demonstrate it out in this world, to give uh, give that uh, people that we come in contact with that great message, Lord, that you've given us, that great salvation that you've given us, Lord. In Jesus' name we pray, amen.